Well, good morning, and uh, we're going to begin our study here this morning with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for the time that we have to study together, uh, for the hearts and minds that are occupied with eternal realities, with the things that are happening upon this earth in the context of the great controversy. And we ask, Lord, that as we open up your word together, that your Holy Spirit can guide and direct us, help us to understand the things we study, and um, that you can, that these things can be learned for a purpose to further your kingdom. We invite your Holy Spirit's presence to be with us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Well, good morning. So we don't have Dwight here this morning. And um, usually I guess it's kind of a bit of a study between him and I. We talk back and forth quite a bit, probably because I talk more than I should. But um, hopefully people can uh, uh, respond with uh, comments and uh, thoughts. Now, we're, we're continuing our study on Numbers 22. We're going to finish this off. So just a quick review. Um, we're actually been studying Judges chapter 11, and we, which is dealing with Jephthah. And we're going to come back to that on Sunday morning. But when we were reading through Jephthah, the study in, in, on Jephthah, it was in, um, trying to find the verse now. Yeah, so Judges... Um, 11 verse 25 it's going to mention uh, Balak the son of Zippor king of Moab and of course we know that this is uh, bringing us to the story of Balaam which is what we've been studying I thought there was another verse too where it mentions yeah so that's going to be yeah, so it just mentions Balak there, and yeah, so it doesn't mention Balaam, but it mentions Balak, and um, so that brought us to the study on on Balaam, uh, because it's going to be Balak, uh, the son of Zippor. So we're going to have this this reference that brings us here now. Part of the, the issue, I guess, is understanding also that this is a reference to Islam. So when we go into the study of Balaam, there's what we call often the three strikes. That is, um, there are three events, major events, uh, in regard to Islam attacking the United States. So when we're looking here in the story of numbers, as you can see on your screen, um, what we are addressing here is, I need to go to the right thing here. Yeah. Uh, we're addressing um, basically the lines that Jeff had had laid out regarding these attacks, starting with 9-11. So there was a discussion um, whether uh, February 26, 1993, the first attack by radical Islam on American soil, and it's also the first at attack on the World Trade Center. So it's the, the, the garage, the underground garage that was bombed, and um, it could have taken out both towers because the idea was to uh, blow up some supports in the north tower and it would it would fall towards the south tower that was the idea and if they had had the van parked 30 meters over according to some experts uh, they would have actually taken out the world trade center but that didn't happen and so 9 11 uh, is the event that fulfilled prophecy. Now, 
what I've always done is I've looked at the event of February 26, 1993 as a foreshadowing. And I'm not going to go into the study of that, but I parallel it with the September 11th, 1814 Battle of Plattsburgh. It becomes a foreshadowing as well. And that's in, in of course, William Miller's history. And, and so there's a parallel there between 9-11, at least as a foreshadow. But we wouldn't take that event and align it with 9-11, um, the Battle of Plattsburgh. But it, it foreshadows it. Now, now, what would be the difference between a foreshadowing and a waymark? So if we're, if we're talking about a foreshadowing, what do you think I mean by that, that something's a foreshadowing? Anybody? It implies that a waymark is going to be happening. Okay. So, so why is it not a waymark? Why wouldn't we say, well, we could we take that foreshadowing, line it up, put it on a line, and have it line up with it, or is it some something else as a foreshadowing? I'm not understanding. Okay. The so. If it's a foreshadowing, does it have a line in and of itself that could be drawn as a line? So we have parallel lines, right? Mm -hmm. But is a foreshadowing a way mark in some line or that would parallel the way mark that it's foreshadowing in another line, if that makes sense? So let's say if we take William Miller's uh, Battle of Plattsburgh sometimes referred to as the Battle of Lake Champlain. So it's on September 11th, but 1814. And um, there's lots in that battle that, you know, there's the great slaughter. Um, he also had had a, an explosive explosion, um, a, a missile, a rocket or whatever, explode near him, and he was unharmed. Um, and he saw God's providence. And so we can look at things or aspects of 9-11 where a mighty angel comes down. And, and for William Miller personally, that was an event that, that parallels 9-11. But in a line, we have all these different waymarks. And if it's, if it's truly a line that lines up, then that event in William Miller's line would line up with 9-11. And um, so let's take a look at that. Um, just do it this way. So I'll share this other screen here in a sec. Actually, I'm going to go, I'll come back to that other one later. Okay, so I'm going to share my, sorry about that, I had this set up and I wrecked it. Okay, so first thing that you see here, this was a chart that I'd made, so I wasn't really going to go into this, but I think I will. Now, this is the fifth trumpet, sixth trumpet, and seventh trumpet. And you'll see I got these big circles with a red line through them. And uh, with this, the fifth trumpet, now here I have 606. Uh, that's the date given on the chart uh, for the rise of the fifth trumpet. And then you're going to see uh, Islam is restrained here. I'm just going to, whoops. Let me grab this here, just move this out of the way, so just so you can see it. Now, this is the 150 years, and this is from 632 to 7, 782. This is the first period of 150 years. Uh, it begins with um, Abu Bakr, his um, uh, decree or whatever it is, his, um, that was another word we used for it. Um, but it starts with Abu Bakr, and it's going to end with the restraint of Islam. Now, this restraint of Islam, though, is not the 150 years. That is, it's not 
even though it's 150 years and it's part of prophecy, it's not the 150 years that is connected with the 391 years and 15 days. So, so I put this over it to show that it's not the first woe. That is, we have woes, but these woes are um, um, specific prophecies that are fulfilled. Now, you're going to see here there's this, um, uh, this other thing that I've put this circle over. This uh, is dealing with the Fatimid Caliph, publicly recognized Caliph in Baghdad by the Buyids. I don't particularly know a lot about all these different caliphs and um, uh, families and so forth. But you'll see the date here, if I move this out of the way, the date here is February 26, 1058. And uh, that date, of course, we can see is going to align up with the, the attack on the World Trade Center on February 26, 1993. Now, nothing particular happens on February 26, 1058. It's in 1058, but where I'm getting this from has to do with the fifth trumpet ending. Now, the fifth trumpet ends in 1449, but we don't have a date in 1449 other than July 27th. But, but there is an event in 1449 that is significant. And anybody know what that event would be? What occurred in 1449? So the fifth trumpet ends, but what, what else occurs there in connection with the ending? So it's the end of 150 years, but why do we mark the end there? in 1449. Anybody know? How about Constantine the 11th? Uh, Dracozis is his other title. So Constantine the 11th, Dracozis, he is going to become the last emperor of Rome. And that's going to happen on March 12th, 1449. So what I did is I counted backwards from that date, 391 years, and I get the date February 26, 1058. Now, why would I count 391 years and 15 days back from March 12th, 1449? What would be my reason for doing that? You guys need to speak more. Because doesn't the 31 nine years and 15 days go forward? It, yeah, it's a mirror of the forward 391. Yeah. And the verse itself says it's prepared for an hour, a day, a month, and a year. So what I look at is this um, caliph coming into, into play here in 1058 is a preparation that's going to lead to the end of uh, the fifth trumpet. So, but again, I put this circle in the line through it to show that it's not the first woe, but it, it is history. These are things that are connected to or foreshadow what's going to happen in regard to the second woe. As we can see, the 150 years, um, prefigures the other 150 years or five months and by going back we get this date that's going to be applied in 1993 February 26th and the first attack on the World Trade Centers so and then you can see here I have the sixth trumpet in the second line beginning in 1449 and I have the Battle of Plattsburgh so the Battle of Plattsburgh is is not the end of um, the second woe. So you have the first woe is 150 years, and then you have the second woe. But it is prefiguring 9/11. And then we have 
1840, we're going to have Islam restrained. And then you're going to see the sixth trumpet is going to sound October 22nd, 1844. So we have the fifth trumpet and the sixth trumpet. And now we have the seventh trumpet. And in the seventh trumpet, this begins to sound October 22nd, 1844. So that's, you know, well accepted. And then you're going to have the first attack on the World Trade Center. And that's going to be February 26, 1993. And then you're going to see that 9-11 is going to mark the beginning of the third woe, where these other ones were marking, this was marking the first one. The first woe, we see Islam is restrained. Then there's 150, 150 years, and then the fifth trumpet ends, or the along with the first woe, and then the second woe doesn't begin, or or doesn't end. It begins in 1449, but it doesn't end when the sixth trumpet ends. It ends four years prior. But you can see there's a restraint here. So I lined up these restraints. And then, of course, we have 9-11 is a restraint of Islam. But it's going to begin the third woe. So we have the first and third woe begin with restraint. The second woe ends with a restraint. Now, what somebody could argue is that the story of Balaam, um, these three different strikes, could refer to uh, this history. I mean, I've, I've never seen anybody do that, but the, the, the application that Jeff made, which we looked at yesterday, um, had some problems as far as it didn't really fit in with the lines the way that they unfolded later on. And, and I know that Jeff moved those things around when it came to uh, July 18th. So the question that I had has to do with these foreshadowings. So I see these as foreshadowings, but I wouldn't take the first attack of the World Trade Center and create a line that's going to make that, that line up with 9-11 as a symbol. Hope people understand what I mean by that. So we can have events that foreshadow other events, but it doesn't mean that they're a part of a line. They're just an event that has similarities to some other event or symbols to some other event that's going to happen. So I, I know this, not everybody's really familiar with this. Now, um, the other thing I wanted to look at then was in 1814, so I'm just flipping through these. Okay, so remember, Miller has a line. And in this line, we do line up his foreshadowing with 9-11. That is, we have a period of darkness. We have uh, this increase of knowledge. And, and you can see here that we lined up at the formalization of this message um, in, this is 1989, this is 1798. But this Miller's line is not the line that we normally use with the Millerites. This is just Miller's personal line. So it does line up with 9-11. And so it is foreshadowing 9-11, but it's also lining up with 9-11. And, and the question is, if we have a foreshadowing, does it have to do this? In this case, it does. Now, of course, we have two different 9-11s, and we line up both of these 9-11s. So remember, in our, this study of understanding the lines, when we did this, um, we were also, at that time, looking at Abraham's line. So, um, but this was one of the things that was quite interesting is that the two 9-11s, so this is a little bit off our topic, but these two 9-11s that we have, which is one event in our history, um, 
is actually two different events if we are going to look at Miller's personal line. So it was actually a really good argument for, um, for this. Now, one, one thing here. So I want you to look at this line again because I think one of the things we're going to have to do after we've gone through a lot of this in the judges is to create some of these lines. Now notice this line here. I call it our line. And, and this isn't what we normally think of our line. So we think of our, our line as being 9-11 to the Sunday law, correct? So, so why do I have then 9-11 being the arrival of the second angel and the Sunday law being the formalization of the second angel? Wouldn't I have it as the close of probation? Does anybody understand what this line is? I know you guys are a quiet bunch. Uh, you're talking about the COP for the for the main line, right? The, the, the mainstream church? Because we're going to go beyond, hopefully, God helping us, we'll go beyond that. Yeah, well, this close of probation here, the arrival of the third angel, is actually the close of probation for the world. Because, Wait, okay. Because Ellen White says that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 is going to come down, right, which is Christ, and that's going to happen at the Sunday law. Um, and then there's going to be the loud cry, which parallels the midnight cry of Millerite history. And, um, and that's going to swell into a loud cry. And then it's, there's going to be a close of probation when Michael stands up. So this here is not really the line we normally think of, even though it starts out the same as 1989, as our other line. Because when we get to 9-11, we put midnight, midnight cry, and then the Sunday law here. But you can see then that when Jeff has done that, he's actually zoomed into the Sunday law waymark or the 9-11 waymark, or he zoomed into this here and creates a, whoops, a, a line right here itself. But Ellen White says that the midnight cry is a parallel, or the loud cry is a parallel to the midnight cry. So the midnight cry is the empowerment of the second angel's message. And so is the loud cry. The Sunday law would then have to line up with the formalization. And, um, and then 9-11, of course, lines up with um, the arrival of the second angel here, April 19th, 1844. But we have another 9-11. So when we start drawing out these lines um, with the judges, we're going to see these same types of things. And we're going to see this when we get into the story of Jephthah, how I've addressed that line, what it means. So we had these in the book of Judges. We had these various enemies, which are messages. And these are enemies that had not been uh, defeated, and they are left there by God for the Israelites uh, to prove them or to test them. And, and the same thing has happen, happened in this movement. There's enemies that have not been defeated, exist in our movement to test people and um, to test this movement. And then we have these judges that are raised up. And we put these in sort of a, a chronological order as they unfolded. But then we had some internal lines. And now with the story of Jephthah, we have this other internal line. So... So there's a number of things that we're thinking about here. So one is we do see that um, Miller's personal 9-11 lines up with 9-11, the empowerment of the first angel's message. 
And his other personal 9-11, that is September 11th, 1816, that's when they have the celebration, the two-year anniversary of the Battle of Plattsburgh, and they were going to have this ball, and they have the preacher come in, they cancel the ball because of the conviction that everyone had, and that's when Miller begins his two years of study that end in 1818. So that also lines up with 9-11, and so we can see that in Miller, there are two 9-11s. Now, in, in doing this, remember, we have this 9-11 is the arrival of the second angel's message. This is the empowerment of the first. So uh, I'm just going to... Uh, I'm just going to copy this slide and do this. So I'm going to get rid of this. Because... So normally we have Millerite history. So I'm going to just draw this in here. I probably have it somewhere else, but I'm just going to redo it again. It's easier uh, for you to follow. So when we put Millerite history, we would, we would have the line look differently. So the Millerite line, um, oh, I should have done this one up here. Do this again, just hang on. Um, yeah, I'm going to do this completely differently. Go like this. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the Millerite line up here. So, and in the Millerite line, um, the formalization here is going to be uh, 1833. The increase of knowledge is that study all this here, that's this increase of knowledge. You can see all of this now is going to be jammed into here. And then, we're, of course, we're going to have August 11th, 1840. And then we're going to have April 19th, 1844. And then we're going to have July 21st, which is, of course, midnight. That. And then we're going to have August 15th, that's the Midnight Cry, and then we're going to have October 22, 1844, which is the close of probation. Right, so when we look at this line here, um, we can see that uh, I'm just going to do this quickly here. So when we look at this line, we look at the Millerite line. We can see that when we, this is how Ellen White would line it up. Right. But if we're going to look at this line, this really we probably should have called Alan White's line or the big line or something like that. But this parallels. This is the repeat of Millerite history. But what we normally do with our line, so I'm going to change it so this truly will be our line, is that we have midnight. Oops. And then we have the midnight cry. And then we have the Sunday law. So I'm just going to do it this way. So it's really the Sunday law close of probation. And that's a close of probation for Adventists. And so the problem that, that Jeff has when he's addressing these three strikes of Islam is he's not certain which line he's on. One is he doesn't have midnight. Somebody have a comment? Okay. 
So he's going to put the strikes at 9-11. This is going to be the wandering um, into the field, being diverted into the field. Now, of course, when we look at our line, we have these two 9-11s. Jeff just brings these together. It's one event, but it has two significance, significations, two purposes. And um, he never even really distinguishes where this diversion into the field, where it's paralleling. That is, he puts it at 9-11, because we know 9-11 is an event, but the question that we have is that we know that 9-11 is represented or parallel to August 11th, 1840, and in Miller's line, remember, he had the two 9-11s, so 9-11 has two different symbols, uh, But because 9-11 is also the first day of the first month, April 19th. Now, do we think it's important that we, when we're dealing with a line itself, that we understand the significance of which 9-11 we're addressing? Even though it's one event, um, so if I took that other line, so I'm just going to go above here and I'm going to grab this line that was our line and I'm going to change its name. So, um, I'm just going to call it the, the big line. I'm going to copy this here. Big line. There we go. So this big line, we can see it's different than this line in its last part but it's the same at the beginning, as they both have 1989. Now, in a technical sense, this part is not really part of the big line, because if I wanted to be more particular about it, um, I would need to uh, connect this to October 22nd, 1844. That is, this is a repeat of history. So Ellen White says this history is going to be repeated in the future. And in a sense, um, this October 22nd, 1844 close of probation lines up with this close of probation, right? So the close of probation that's still coming for everyone. And could we say that when the judgment begins on October 22nd, 1844, that we're still in that day of judgment? Can we say that? Yes. Yeah, so we're still in that. And in, in according to Ellen White, we're in the time of the third angel's message. We're in the sealing time, right? Sealing time begins October 22nd, 1844. It's the Day of Atonement. We're still in that Day of Atonement. And that Day of Atonement has the sealing aspect, and it has the third angel's message aspect. So it's the third angel's message. And she is just going to be looking for the Sunday law, right? That's what she's going to be looking for. The Sunday law, loud cry, close of probation. So she's only looking for this. Now, but when she looks for this, she talks about Revelation 18. But she doesn't make a distinction between the Sunday law and what we call 9-11. That is, we realize that the second angel arrives but it arrives in connection with the Sunday law, because that's what Ellen White says. And so critics of this movement have argued that Jeff, in saying that 9-11 is Revelation 18, which is clearly in the spirit of prophecy, the Sunday law, that he had misplaced it. But if we recognize that we're in the Day of Atonement, that we're in a period of time, that there's nothing wrong with recognizing that 9-11 is Revelation 18, but it's not It's not that way in Ellen White's line. That is, she just sees the Sunday law. 
So over here where I have the close of probation, uh, you know, Ellen White would put the Sunday law, the loud cry, the close of probation, seven last plagues, the second coming, you know, all those different events that are afterwards, after October 22, 1844. She does say that there is going to be a repeat of history. So in a sense, she does see this line, but even when she sees this line, the close of probation is the close of probation. But we have a, this line, and this line we zoomed into. So the question is, why am I doing all this? When we look at, um, and I'll just open it up here. Just hang on a second. Um, let's bring it here. So this is the chart that, um, no, I'll do it this other way, uh, that Dwight um, shared with us the other day. And it's going to open up. There we go. Slow. So this was Jeff's study from January 31st, 2015, and we know that was shortly after he started to understand uh, these attacks by Islam, and that would be in connection with this uh, story of Balaam, and that there are going to be these different strikes. Now Jeff is going to have the asses turned out of the way, that's going to be 9-11. There's going to be these double walls that the that the ass is is uh, passing between, that's going to be the midnight cry, which to Jeff was still future. And then we have the Sunday law, the ass in this narrow place, and then the ass is going to speak. So, and then it says over here, third world, world begins Islam. I'm not sure what this is over here. So then we have this close of probation. So it'd be the general clo close of probation for the world. Um, so I'm not sure why he has the third woe begins over here, but that may be that he's dealing with, oh, he's dealing with this history of um, uh, the Revelation 9, right? So it's just not uh, perfectly clear here. Now, the question that that Dwight had asked was about 1993. So 1993, of course, is before 2001. And is it a way, Mark? It, would it be the first one, the ass turning out of the way? And then if you did that, then what would you do with 9-11? And how would you look at these, proceed, these following um, strikes? But we see, saw that the problem here is that Jeff doesn't have these clear distinctions of these lines. So the question is, can we take those three strikes and place them in different places in different lines? That is, can we have what we call the third strike as something that's already been fulfilled but isn't the third strike on the bigger line? Can we do that? Is that allowed? Now, I know you guys aren't really answering too much, but um, when we look at when we look at these lines, what's missing in this line?
Remember, this is 2015. So, so what's missing? Uh, midnight. Yeah, so midnight's missing. <laughs> and, and is midnight important um, if we're going to draw this line correctly? If we're going to be able to sort it out? And we've, we would have to argue, yes, it would be an important way mark. But in the beginning of 2015, we didn't have midnight. We had only found out the midnight cry, you know, six or seven months previous. And so now that we, we've understood the midnight cry, uh, we're starting to fill in some of the details. But then we're going to find out about midnight uh, near the end of 2015. And that's going to be something that becomes a part of our lines in 2016. So, so when Jeff is doing this, when he's trying to sort through this and putting these things on a line, he doesn't know what line he's on. And, and you can see here, since the close of probation is here, he's obviously not having the third way mark as being the Sunday law. Now, we could argue that he's, because the lines in 2015 would normally be written 9-11, Midnight Cry, Sunday Law, because the Sunday Law lined up with the close of probation. So maybe you could just say he's, he's just adding this fourth way mark because there is another close of probation, and we could say that this is all, Sunday Law to the close of probation, is all the ass speaking. That's the United States speaking by its legislative powers. And this is the mark of the beast, the test, all these types of things. Um, and he uses the story of Nabal and David and Abigail. But we're not going to look at that at the moment. So, so he could say this is a period of time, but we've never really done that. We've never put the Sunday law and then a period of time close of probation as just being one way mark. And of course, we know the loud cry would be in between this. So when Jeff first started out, he'd have 1989 um, as his first way mark. That would be the time of the end. And then he'd have his second way mark, which would be um, the Sunday law. And then his third way mark would be the close of probation. So he actually never even had these two other waymarks, the Midnight Cry and 9-11. And so he had 1989, Sunday Law. And, and actually, I think he, actually, he, he would have even had sometimes the Second Coming, which is zooming out even more from the close of probation. Because you could argue if the close of probation to the Second Coming is all really about the Second Coming. So hopefully this is helping people. I need a little bit of feedback. Is this um, is this making sense? How I'm critiquing this, or is there any? Because I'm I'm not trying to confuse people. If I am, um, I need to clarify that. So that means everybody understands it fully. So when we go back to numbers 22, and we have this story of Balaam. We're going to read through this now. Um, and God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. And Balaam rose up early in the morning and said unto the princes of Balak, Get you into your land, for the Lord refuseth to give me leave to go with you. And the princes of Moab rose up, and they went unto Balak, and said, um, Balak, a Balaam refuseth to come with us. And Balak sent yet again princes more and more honorable than they. And they came to Balaam and said unto him, Thus saith Balak, the son of Zippor, Let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me. For I will promote thee into very great honor, and, will, and do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. 
Come therefore, I pray thee, curse me, this people. And Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, If Balak would give his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Now therefore, I pray you, tarry ye also here this night, that I may know what the Lord will say unto me more. So, I mean, we know the story here, and we've looked at some of this already. Now, God comes to Balaam at night, right, and said unto him, if men come up to call thee, right, so we've gone through this. But he says explicitly, do not go with them. Right, and then there's going to be, um, so he's going to rise up in the morning and saddle his ass and went to, unto the princes of Moab. So God comes to him, says, don't go. And he completely disobeys. So now he's going to be on this journey, right? So we had looked at this, and the so the God's anger was kindled because he went. So we know from the spirit of prophecy, they didn't come to him in the morning, and this was um, his decision. If they come to me, or, or God said, if they come to you in the morning, you can go with them. But they don't. So he makes this decision to just go after them anyway. So he again is disobeying God. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass and his two servants were with him. Now, what is this adversary? Why, I mean, is this something symbolic? We haven't actually addressed this at all. What's what's the adversary? I think it's Christ trying to stop him. Okay. So um yeah, so it's an adversary against him. Um and it's Christ. So Christ is going to come and try to, um, what we say, stop him. Um, of course, he doesn't. So, I mean, it's, Christ could stop him if he wanted to. But he's trying to illustrate something here. So the, the thing about this word adversary is it's the name Satan. So what's the significance of that? Because we're saying it's Christ. Yeah, it would mean it's opposing him. But we have an angel, and, and we wouldn't say it's Satan opposing him, right? So I'm just going to read here from Patriarchs and Prophets, uh, page 441. But the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. The animal saw the divine messenger, who was unperceived by the man, and turned aside from the highway into a field. With cruel blows, Balaam brought the beast back into the path. But again, in a narrow place shut in by walls, the angel appeared in the animal, trying to avoid the menacing figure crushed her master's foot against the wall. Balaam was blinded to the heavenly interposition and knew not that God was obstructing his path. So in the first one, is it just the angel and the second one, is it God? Or, or is it God in both places?
because it says the angel appeared and the animal trying to avoid the menace, menacing figure crossed her master's foot against the wall. Now, is it just God is obstructing his past path in that he sends an angel to do that? Or is it Christ? Any idea on this? Well, I'm thinking about, about Moses when he delayed circumcising his son and said the angel of the Lord appeared with a sword and was going to slay him. And then Joshua, too, when he saw that, thought it was a man, I guess, armed. And he said, are you for us or, or, or against us? And it was described as the angel of, of the Lord, as I recall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Iran says an angel can represent God, even if it's an angel. Or, yeah, it says, um, yeah. So, so this is a messenger, whether it's, it's Christ or whether it's just an angel. Um, I don't know if it's clear, at least at this point. So he's going to be shut in this narrow place between these two walls. He's going to crush his master's foot against the wall and uh, then beats his mass, his ass unmercifully and forced it to proceed. Again, in a narrow place, there was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. The angel appeared as before in a threatening attitude, and the poor beast, trembling with terror, made a full stop and fell to the earth under its rider. Balaam's rage was unbounded, and with his staff he smote the animal more cruelly than before. God now opened its mouth, and by the dumb ass, and by the dumb ass speaking with the man's voice, he forbade the madness of the prophet. What have I done unto thee, it said, but thou hast smitten me these three times. So so we're going to have this, um, him going out into the field, then he's going to be between two walls, a narrow place, he's going to have his foot crushed. And then as he proceeds, uh, we have this angel in the way, and the ass doesn't want to move forward. And so now he's going to uh, beat him, beat the ass. And, and, and we know that he is, thou hast smitten me these three times. So we have, when he turns out of the way, he's smitten. When he's between these two walls. And then when it gets narrow again, we're going to have the third time. So these three times that he's struck. So what do these represent? Balaam represents the United States. Do you think those those verses could stand for years, like 2022, 2023, 2024? Okay, so you're saying that we could take... No, I'm just asking. Okay, you're asking. Okay, so if we're going to create a line, right? if we're going to... Um, So if we're going to create a line like that, the way that we have done it is we look at a way mark on a line. So we can look at 9-11, maybe, you know, some other event in the future. And you could take other lines that already exist and you can place them in that way mark because a way mark has a line and it can have parallels. I mean, that's really the purpose of the line is to parallel it with other lines. So we can do that, and then, and and only then can we really understand that way mark and the way marks that it's connected to. Otherwise, we can have events, but if we're not sure where we're placing those events within a line, then 
we can misunderstand it. So the question was kind of, can these three strikes still be future? Is that kind of what you're asking, Angela? Yeah, at least, yeah, sure. Okay. So, so if we're going to do that, so one is, again, we have to have a line. But we know if we put them future, they're not the prior, like, they're not connected with our line. That is, they could, we could zoom into a waymark and take this story and see maybe three events. But that wouldn't be the prop, that wouldn't be the full application of this. That is, we believe that these three strikes uh, represent um, events that include 9-11. Now, here, here is another thought. So, and I'd already had mentioned this before. But could this also relate to the woes themselves? That is, could the first strike be the first woe, the second strike, the second woe, and the third strike, the third woe? And I want you to, to think about this and comment on it. Because if we were going to do that, how would we do it? If we're okay, Angela, I really don't know. <laughs> okay, well, I'll help you a little bit here. So I'm just going back. Find this one. Okay. Not the line I want. Okay, here's a line. Okay, let's just look at some lines I've drawn before. Now, uh, this line here. It's actually about the seven thunders to some degree. I got these things marked one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is part of another study. Uh, you can see I have the first angel arrives, it's formalization, it's empowerment. The second angel arrives, it's formalization, it's empowerment. The third angel arrives. And you can see I have like May 1842 for the second angel arriving. So this is a chart I made a long time ago uh, prior to our understanding that April 19th was the arrival of the second angel. So, so this is an old line, but it's still useful. Um, in, in Millerite history, so what I have above here, of course, is, and you can see 1622, I have that's the date that uh, Uriah Smith used. I'm going to replace it with 606 for the, uh, that first way mark. This is going to uh, mark Muhammad, right? And then you're going to see the 150 years, that period of 150 years. I think I made this chart in 2015, but I added stuff to it later. And then you see July 27, 1299. So we see, of course, the second woe. And the second woe ends in Millerite history. Now, it's going to end in connection with these events regarding Islam, that is Turkey, in 1840. But, but it proceeds from a series of events. So there was the, the Battle of Trafalgar, um, which is going to be in 1800, um, was it, was it 1804? Was there one in 1808? I'm trying to remember, my brain is just not functioning. Yeah, I think it was in 1804. But because um, what what Dwight did is he put 184 years uh, between that and so let me think if that's 18 um, is 1805. Oh, so, okay. Right. So you have the 184 years, which have represented 1840. Uh, so that's that's what what uh, Dwight was doing. Now, um, you can see here I have 
just that earlier part of the study we looked at where I line up 1814 with uh, February 26, 1993. Um, and here I have a whole bunch of question marks about, so this was me just doing thought experiments more than anything by drawing them out so that I could remember what I had thought about. And um, you can see that, that this line has um, the Millerite line and our line in these, these ways of, of understanding. Now we would say in the Millerite line, the second woe is going to be ending. And in our history, the third woe is going to be beginning. Right? So you can see how this September 11th, 1814 precedes August 11th, 1840, and how this February 26, 1993 precedes September 11th, 2001. So you can see how that how that fits together. Now, the next one I want to look at is, we looked at that. Um, well, maybe I do want to go back there again. Oh yeah, that's what I wanted to do. So just hang on. Okay, there we go. Okay, so when we look at this this chart again, could we put Balaam and on his ass turning into the field in connection with the first woe? And what would that mean? So if we took that Islam is restrained. That is, the first woe begins on July 27th, 1299. Could that be represented by Balaam on this ass? Now, we say Balaam represents the United States. But in this case, who would Balaam represent? Because the United States doesn't exist in 1299. Does it represent Rome? Okay. How would how would Balaam represent Rome? What what symbol would allow Balaam to represent Rome? Unless you're just guessing. Did you have a rationale, William, why you would say that? I was just, I just assuming since Rome represents the United States, it, it might represent Balaam. Okay, so, so Rome can represent the United States. Okay. And we would look at this battle is, is though in 1299. I mean, the papacy is not involved. Well, sorry about that. I just muted you. So the, the papacy is not involved here. So you can unmute yourself, William, if you want. Angela? I'm yeah. going to turn to Revelation 9 because my brain is so foggy. Okay. So in Revelation 9... We're going to have that first woe, that, and that's going to be um, the second period of five months that's mentioned, right? Because you have the fifth angel, you have the fifth trumpet sound, you're going to have a period of five months connected with Abu Bakr's command, and then you're going to have uh, Islam doing all this destruction, and then they're going to mention five months again. They ha their power was to hurt men five months. And, and so there's definitely two periods of five months, and they both can be marked. And then the first woe is going to be this king over the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon, destruction. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more. So the question is, who are the wo woes? fighting against
The trumpets are judgments upon blank. Well, it's not the papacy. It's going to be Eastern Rome. East? No, it's just East. Wasn't there? Wasn't West Rome yet? Right? I don't know. I don't remember this. Well, Western Rome had had already fallen as far as okay. the Roman Empire, and the papacy had risen. Right. But these are going to be judgments upon Eastern Rome, not Western Rome. That's what the uh, the fifth and sixth trumpets are upon Eastern Rome, and the seventh trumpet is judgments upon modern Rome. So when we look at Eastern Rome, does Eastern Rome typify modern Rome? Yeah, it has to. It's still Rome. Rome never changes. Yeah. Except it worsen. But it's typified. But it is a different power. So when we deal with modern Rome, the armies of modern Rome are the United States. Right. So we, we can we can associate the United States there with modern Rome. But anyway, be that as it may, when we look at these woes, the the first two are judgments upon Eastern Rome. And the third woe is a judgment upon um, modern Rome. So if we're looking at this chart here, we can say that, that what's being judged there is Eastern Rome. Islam is going to be restrained. There's going to be um, a restraint of Islam in July, on July 27th, 1299. And then we have 150 years. And then we're going to have Islam restrained at the end of the second woe. Now, in this history at the end of the second woe, well, we're not we're not dealing with Islam attacking Rome so much. But it is a time in which the United States begins its um, battles with with radical Islam. So the Battle of Trafalgar is uh, the one that Dwight brought up. So we should be able to see that, could, well, or could we say that that is the crushing of the foot? And if it is the crushing of the foot, um, how would that come about? Is Does Islam crush the foot of the United States. On in that in Millerite history. Are you, talking, are, you, are you talking about at 9 11? No, I'm talking about in Millerite history. Well, when the restraint put on put on them at August 11th, 1840. Right. So, can we put August 11th, 1840? Have any to do with the United States? I mean, they're not one of the signees of the ultimatum. The United States is pretty insignificant in Millerite history. As far as like politically in, in in war events, obviously it's important for the Millerites, but the United States is not a significant power as it came to become. Came to become as it later became. How's that? So the United States is having battles with Islam, but does its foot get crushed? In Millerite history, okay. What can a foot represent? Well, 
What does a foot symbolize? Anybody know? Oh, one's walk with God or, or the uh, gospel itself. Right. So it, a person's walk with God. Thy, thy word is uh, the, a light unto their feet, um, feet and a light unto yeah. my path. Right. Um, we also mm -hmm. have the preparation of the gospel of peace. Um, right. Dealing with um, the feet in Ephesians chapter six and then you have um, um, other references to the foot dealing with the spreading of of the gospel so if if the crushing of the foot represents something about the United States in Millerite history how would Islam be connected with the United States in Millerite history as far as crushing its foot or its ability to spread the gospel. I just don't see it. I'm not at that point. Okay. Um, is there a change between the relations of, of the nations connected with, with Islam in the 18, 1800s, especially the 1840s. There's four European powers that um, put a restraint on them. There's a restraint placed upon them, but that restraint, what are they being restrained from? The, the pirates, but that's all I can think of. Like, I haven't studied the history, so. Okay, there's the pirates. Now, as far as spreading the gospel, do the pirates affect the spread of the gospel? That is, what, what is happening with Islam? Is it, it hindering the spread of the gospel by the United States? By the, I mean, we know the United States becomes uh, apostate. It joins Babylon, right? In rejection, rejection of the first angel's message. So I don't, I don't know the answer to that completely. But... If that's what the crushing of the foot is, we would have to find in that history, the time in when the Bible societies are spreading the gospel everywhere, that Islam becomes a hindrance to that. And, and I don't know the history well enough to say, you know, specifically what happened or how true that is compared to other times. But I then think we're gonna I have, read that that. Jewish convert Joseph Joseph Wolf, I think it was his name. He he went through some of those Islamic places mm -hmm. and was successful. Right. So they would have oh, to I do just something stopping that. Thoroughly puzzled about this now. Yeah. So you know. So again, I don't have a good answer to that. Um, now, when it comes to the track attack on the World tr uh, Trade Centers, we already had attached that to restraint because of the fact that a Sunday law was coming. So, so in some ways, maybe we could, and I'm not, I'm not saying that we do, but we could make an application of the woes where the third woe is, because it's all part of the Sunday law history, is the one where the ass speaks. Instead of the one where it goes out of the way. Uh, we're holding beers on the cabinet, so I can run a screwdriver and take the beers off. Okay. So, so, I, so, in examining this, what I'm suggesting is that we could look at this differently. That is, we could look at the story of Balaam, which we're going to go back to here. Um. We could look at the story of Balaam as something that represents not just the United States, but Ro Rome in general, or t technically, technically the first, second, and third woe. And, and there would be a logic to it, whether we placed it the way that I suggested we might be able to. But in this case, then, 9-11 wouldn't be the first event 
it would be the first woe. But we know in our history that the first, second, and third angels' messages, the first and second are repeated. And could we argue then that these woes that could initially be applied to Islam or these three strikes being the three woes applied to Islam, that in our history, we're in a repeat of history and we apply them in some ways to our history by comparison. So it's just a thought. Doesn't mean it's correct. Now, um, in verse 24 here, it says, but the angel of the Lord stood in a path of the vineyards, a wall being on one side and a wall on that side, right? So we had done some study into these walls. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself into the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. And he smote her again. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place. There was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote the ass with a staff. Now, when he, when the, the ass here falls down under Balaam, what would that represent? If Balaam is the United States, I mean, the, the one problem, you know, or not a problem, but just trying to understand why the United States is riding this ass. But when Balaam falls down, or the ass falls down, Balaam's on it, um, what could this possibly represent? So if the ass falls down, we, we assume Balaam falls down as well. So what would this represent? Perhaps the, well, I guess it's the Pope winning against the U.S. and against Islam. I mean, they're all going to worship the beast, right? Hmm. Okay. I mean, that's one way you could look at it. Well, this, this would be a strike, right? I mean, so we look at this as the Sunday law because the ass is going to speak, though the ass here speaking it's it's obviously the united states that's speaking under the sunday law not islam so that's one of the points that we're going to have to address why the ass is speaking at the sunday law of course balaam's riding it so technically this is something that has to do with the sunday law now we did talk about the idea that this could represent the Democrats. But we know, or we believe, that it's going to be the Republicans who are going to bring in the Sunday law, right? That's what we were thinking, but then I thought, well, the ask is represent the Democrats, so I don't know, yeah, we, this hasn't happened yet. Okay. So Iran says it's a combination, and I would think it would have to be. That is, it's not going to be a unilateral decision. It's going to be, um, um, what do they call it, bilateral? Yeah, if they're too involved, two parties involved. Yeah, both party, yeah, so both parties would work together in order to have something like that happen. So that's another problem that I've seen in, in mm. all the different end time scenarios. So all these different end time scenarios, because as an Adventist, I've seen hundreds of end time scenarios based upon what's happening in the news today. What's going to happen? Adventists are great at making these guesses about what's going to happen. And we know then that we have a really divided nation. So one of the arguments that we have a nuclear attack is that this is something that brings both parties together. 
just like we saw at 9-11. I, I think the thing that, that was the most remarkable for me about 9-11, there's a couple of things, but one of the most remarkable is how uh, politics, partisan politics, sort of fell by the way. And of course, you know, people were praying in public, everywhere. Nobody was getting upset. Well, there was a few that were getting upset, but nobody was listening to them um, after 9-11. For a short while, the United States became a very religious country. Didn't maintain that, but, and whether it's truly religious or not, I don't know. But Democrats were supportive. They weren't complaining about anything that was happening. It's a Republican government, of course, under George Bush when 9-11 occurred. But um, this is something we have to examine. So we definitely didn't get finished here. Uh, comment? Somebody have a comment? William? Yeah, I was going to say, uh, well, did they get along in the pandemic? They did or didn't? I asked him, did they get along with the pandemic? No, because we had Trump. Uh, yeah. It, yeah. Trump derangement syndrome was still in full force. Right. So Trump's just too hated for the two parties to get along. Um, but the question is, and, and, and of course, it's the type of the Sunday law. In, in some ways, there's an agreement. I mean, Trump, you know, acquiesced to the, the demands for a vaccine, and, and he's the one who got the ball rolling on it, um, though it was really implemented just at the end of his term. Um, I was just bringing it across, did they get along? I don't know if they did get along, because I, all I heard was a bunch of fights. At 9-11 or at the pandemic? At the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. Definitely they didn't get along. Okay, so anyway, our time is up. We're going to have to continue examining this on Sunday. And uh, hopefully Dwight is better by then. I didn't realize how much I depend upon him in this study uh, to have a discussion. But you guys helped a little bit, so thanks. And uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful um, for all the things you teach us. We pray for Dwight, that you can help him to recover. We know that he's overtaxed many times, and we just pray that um, this will give him a chance to rest and heal. Uh, we pray for each person involved in these studies, that you can help us with our particular needs, and be with us throughout this day until we meet again, Friday evening for a study. And we ask, Lord, that um, you can help us to think on these things and to understand them. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.